Welcome everyone to our next Berlin Contemporary China Network lecture series. Um, and actually it's the last one on the topic of digital governance. My name is Genia Koska and I'm a professor at the Freie Universität of Berlin. And it's my real honor to have today Ariane Olier Malatere as a speaker. Um, we will now really talk about citizens' perspectives, and she just has an amazing new book out, and um, she will present this today. Uh, you can see it already on the screen. It's called Living with Digital Surveillance in China. Um, Ariana is really uh, an amazing, productive scholar. Ariana, whenever I look at your CV, I'm like uh, over 70 peer-reviewed articles and also so interdisciplinary. Um, very amazing to see. And your book is really, I actually had the honor to review it. And um, it's yeah, really uh, was groundbreaking because I think no one has unpacked this so well as you did. Um, so very excited to have you as a speaker. But for those who don't know Ariane, she's a professor, uh, a management professor and the director of the International Network on Technology, Work and Family at the University of Quebec in Montreal. And uh, she really does research on digital technologies and the boundaries between work and life across different national contexts. But I'm very impressed because she does very different national contexts, but actually her focus of the book is just China. And uh, it's a very timely topic, as we all know, because surveillance in China is very much advanced. So, Ariana, I head over to you very much looking forward to what you learned. Um, uh, on surveillance and what citizens actually think about it. So over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Genia and Anton as well, and Selina. I, uh, I have enjoyed the whole um, BCC and lecture series, and I'm very honored uh, to conclude it uh, this year. Um, so you've set expectations very high, <laughs> Genia. I hope I, I, I hope I can meet these expectations. Uh, I'm very excited to um, share my work with you today. It's been five years of work. Um, I hope you, you learned something uh, from it and are uh, interested uh, by it. So let's see if I can now move these slides. Can you see them now? I think that didn't, didn't work. Now we see like two, two things. Oh. Okay, so that wasn't the right. <sighs> We tested that. Can you see it now? Can you make it full screen, um, maybe? Because we see two slides. We see, a... yeah, now it's better. And now the full view. Okay. So Perfect. is that working now? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the book was just out uh, two months ago, and I, I have many uh, colleagues to um, to thank for, uh, and in particular, Guinea, as you mentioned, you have generously endorsed uh, that book, but many other people have helped me um, uh, navigate this new process for me. So, of course, um, digital surveillance is not unique to China, and this is very important to uh, specify. Uh, and there are many Chinese studies uh, people today in the audience, but I recognize some of my colleagues who are not. So that's why I'm giving some uh, reminders about what's happening, the digital footprints that people live in China. Uh, so perhaps more than in other countries uh, across the globe, um, people do leave many, many digital traces every day because they use all encompassing platforms such as WeChat, and they use it not only as we do to talk with friends and families, text and send messages, uh, but also to check the news, uh, to post and entertain themselves, to work. WeChat is actually more used than email uh, to, you know, do every sorts of everyday uh, acts, such as calling a taxi, paying the subway, other transportation. Even you can even pay your taxes on WeChat. And of course, uh, cash has almost disappeared in China. Uh, so um, we pay everything with WeChat Pay and Alipay. On top of that, there is um, a number of facial recognition cameras. Uh, real name registration with your ID and phone number is mandatory for many internet uses. And uh, the uh, famously debated social credit systems 
uh, are being experimented in different municipalities, different provinces, and different commercial platforms. The most famous is Sesame Credit, but there are also uh, public uh, governmental social credit systems. So my research questions um, for this project uh, really revolve around Chinese citizen surveillance imaginaries um, at the intersection of surveillance studies, privacy studies, internet studies, but also, of course, Chinese studies. Um, if I phrase them in very practical terms, I was interested in understanding to what extent when you live in such a context with such exposure to surveillance, do you even notice it in your daily life? And what do you know about uh, the different facets? For instance, the social credit system has been debated, but do citizens really know about it? And what do they know? Do you change your behavior um, in anticipation of, of what's happening? Uh, how do you perceive it? How do you make sense of it? How does the context shape your imaginary and your discourse? And last but not least, how do you feel regarding such exposure to surveillance? Um, a humbling endeavor indeed, because I am not a sinologist. Uh, my background is in sociology, management, IO psychology. Uh, what I do have is experience interviewing in different countries and, and, and you know, long time interest for national context. So I plan two years ahead of my sabbatical leave uh, to go interview people in China. Um, I secured invitation in three universities as well as a research visa. I took Mandarin courses, of course, not enough. Um, and I, I really uh, thought hard about how I was going to approach this because I really didn't want to be reading that much on China mostly from Western scholars that I would arrive in China with a host of stereotypes or Eurocentric biases. So I made a perhaps an orthodox decision. I began with a backpack a solo trip on one of the silks roads from, from Beijing to Kashgar, uh, taking advantage of the high speed train. Um, and I did not read a lot about China really uh, before I went uh, to interview. Uh, I wanted to be able to hear what people were saying without these Eurocentric biases. So of course it was a lot harder to cut the data <laughs> because I was lost and perplexed uh, in many instances. But uh, after I had the first drafts of themes and patterns, I went to the literature and then a lot of it made, made better sense. I used a polycontextual analytical lens uh, to account for multiple layers of the Chinese uh, context, that theoretical lens. So how do you conduct qualitative fieldwork in China when you're a, a foreigner? And as you can see, I very much appear to be a foreigner in China. Um, well, this is not easy. Um, I, um, I had a research diary and I conducted 58 um, in-depth interviews in Chengdu, Shanghai, and Beijing. Uh, that was just before the borders closed. Uh, there were all Chinese citizens except three foreigners who had long-standing residence in China, uh, most face-to-face, -face, um, and about half was an interpreter because uh, I don't speak Mandarin well enough to be able to uh, think of my on my feet in Mandarin and follow up and do the prompts and all of that. So half with an interpreter and half without an interpreter because uh, actually many interviewees insisted that they could handle the interview in English. They were proud of that. So we did that. Um, uh, interviewing as a as a white woman, uh, and, you know, entailed uh, many challenges. Uh, I really was self-conscious, try to listen to participants in a non-judgmental, non-interfering way, even when they were saying things that were highly surprising to me, and they did. Uh, I tried to put my own baggage and views at a distance. Um, I, I have a whole chapter in the book on self-censorship, political speak, and how I handled that. Uh, if we have time, or maybe in the Q&A, uh, I have a couple of slides also on, on how I navigated sensitive topics. And of course, I tried to buffer uh, everyone, um, including the interpreters, against political risks. Um, so 58 interviews, of course, uh, the book absolutely does not claim 
to capture uh, the whole of China. Um, uh, the sample remains more educated and urban than China's rural population, as is the case for many, many uh, studies in China. I did um, work with my colleagues to balance the sample. We have three different cities and one of them, Chengdu, is not on the East Coast. Uh, I do have migrant workers in hairdressing salons. I have secretaries. I have a campus security guard, several taxi drivers. So we did everything we could to balance uh, the sample. So I want to give you an overview of the key findings. And then I'm going to dive into uh, three chapters uh, a little bit more. So first, um, a key finding for me was that um, the participants made sense of digital surveillance by uh, weaving a cohesive system of moral narratives. And what that system did is that um, it framed digital surveillance as an indispensable solution to China's problems. So more specifically, there were two sets of moral narratives. The first set was a set of really anguishing narratives that framed China as having moral problems, moral failures, moral short shortcomings. And these narratives produced fear, shame, anguish. Of course, you, it's not comfortable. So to answer that, um, the participants brought uh, two sets of redeeming narratives that really acted as an antidote to, uh, to the moral shortcomings narratives as a response. So these redeeming narratives were narratives of digital protection. So the government and technology is going to solve all of these problems. And taken together, uh, this system created a logical setting where a surveillance was seen as welcome and actually an indispensable solution to, um, to uh, solve the problems and propel China on uh, the way to, this, to, um, to have the glory of the civilization uh, shine in the world. Um, so if I, if I um, specify a bit more. So the three narratives of moral shortcomings. The first one is a very well known by sinologists. It's the lack of moral quality. Very much to my surprise, before I had read uh, Chinese studies, I heard many participants lament that their fellow citizens did not follow the rules, uh, that they actually should be treated as children, uh, uh, that you need rules and punishments because in China, people just don't follow the rules. Um, it echoed, you know, Ya Wenlei's uh, talk of low end and high end population. So it was really dichotomic language, good and bad. And um, we need uh, surveillance because people lack moral quality. Uh, the second one was the century of humiliations by foreign powers actually combined with continued fears to be undermined or attacked, in particular by Muslim populations. So that's what sinologists call a culture of insecurity or a civilization complex. And this set the stage to, uh, for the imperative to revive the ancient Chinese civilization and gain international recognition. And the third one is a negative view of privacy as a suspicious desire to hide shameful information. And I'm going to, uh, to talk more about this in a couple of minutes. So as you can see, if you picture China as lacking moral quality, having a history of humiliations, and you picture privacy as being something suspicious, uh, this raises not so comfortable emotions. And the solution to that is uh, actually to rely on the government because the government was seen as a protective parental figure, uh, surveillance as care, surveillance necessary because China is, quote unquote, an unge ungovernable country. Uh, and then technology as a magic bullet that can force people to adhere to rules and modernize the country and uproot secrecy. So that was the picture at the discursive level. And um, it actually confirms what you found, Guinea, with your colleagues in, in many studies, that uh, on the discursive level, uh, there is high support for surveillance uh, in China. 
However, uh, the book uncovers the other side of the medal, which is the cognitive and the emotional cost of exposure to surveillance. At the same time that they hold these discourses, the interviewees convey great tension um, and the, um, the support for surveillance coexisted with misgivings, objections, mental tactics to dissociate oneself from surveillance. Interestingly, the misgivings arose when participants pondered how they felt about surveillance more than how they thought of surveillance. Um, we, I heard dislike, resentment, worries, frustration, fear, even anger. Uh, in particular, the participants feared uh, being singled out by surveillance. They built self-protective rationales, for, for instance, othering the targets of surveillance, saying that, you know, I am a small potato, I'm not important, I'm not being surveilled. So the underlying paradox in this, um, in this whole posture could be summarized as surveillance is good for China. However, I don't like it and I don't want to think about it. So let's dig a little more into these paradoxes. The structure of the book reflects uh, the findings that I have just explained. In the beginning, you have, you know, necessary literature reviews, and it's actually important to replace surveillance in its historical context. Then I uh, detail the, the anguish in narratives, the redeeming narratives, and the mental and emotional weight. So let's dig in particular uh, on the matter of privacy, and then I want to discuss the mental tactics and the misgiving and objections. Privacy uh, in Mandarin um, uh, can be uh, expressed with two words. Uh, so the first one is very similar to the Western definition. It's a personal thing you do not wish to disclose in public, whatever the nature of that, perhaps what I had for breakfast, you know. Um, the second thing, however, um, has a more particular meaning, more pejorative meaning. It's hiding a shameful secret. And when I ask participants, so, so what is privacy for you? What do you view as private? Can you cite me some behaviors that you think are private? They were clearly uh, designating the hiding of shame to save face. Uh, so they wanted to control the exposure of shameful information and feelings to the specific social groups that could judge them negatively. And the objective was to maintain moral and social respectability. For instance, you'd never shoplift with a friend, but you might take a chance if you're alone, even if there is a camera. Because, you know, it's not your mom, it's not your friends uh, looking at the camera. It's people you don't know, so it's not as important. So what do you hide? Uh, the scope of privacy um, in, in Chinese thought, face has at least two dimensions. The first one is moral face, the second is social face. So moral face, um, you would hide the behaviors, thought, emotions that can be judged negatively by others. What participants mentioned was purchase of personal medicine, that's code for Viagra, underwear, sex-related products, uh, weapons. So all of that they mentioned uh, as private. The second dimension is the relative social status. Because shame can be induced if you have a lower status than, than the other person. Also, if you have a higher status, you make more money. That's embarrassing for others. So you also hide financial information. Uh, I love this quote. Uh, I don't know if it's a real joke in China, but at least, you know, they said it like that. Uh, so if you're in a fire and you have to go out naked, you you hide your face because that's what's important. So who do you hide from? You hide from social groups much more than the government. What they mentioned was parents and supervisors, hackers, because they can disclose your personal information to parents and supervisors, but they did not as much mention abstract entities such as the government. For instance, something that was utterly puzzling for me on the Weibo. So Weibo is like Twitter X, I should say, a large public social network. Um, but it does require a real name registration. Of course, the government has access to that if they want to retrace what someone writes. But they still said because they had pen names, they didn't feel concerned about their privacy. 
See, for instance, on Weibo, it's different. You can be yourself. Nobody identifies you. It's an escape. Um, the other thing I want to explain is the mental tactics that they use to dissociate themselves from surveillance. So here's the big picture here, and I'm going to explain each of the different uh, four uh, mental tactics, which are brushing surveillance aside, try to ignore, authoring surveillance targets, wearing blinders, and resorting to fatalism. I had as many as 88% of participants who mentioned at least one of these mental tactics. So that's really a lot, like almost all of them mention at least one of these mental tactics. So the first one, brushing surveillance aside, consisted in minimizing, denying that there was surveillance. Nobody's watching. So I heard that so much that at some point I was a bit frustrated. Um, I recorded an announcement on a high speed train. Um, the announcement clearly explained uh, because of the social credit system, you are being there are cameras in the train, you need to behave, otherwise you are your score will go down. So I uh, recorded that and when I played it out to an interviewee, <laughs> she just said, maybe they're bluffing. So really deep, uh, denying uh, that this even exists. Uh, another tactic, ignoring. Um, I can accept it, I'll ignore it. I choose to ignore it, I don't think of it. It's true, but it does not harm me. It does not remind me all the time. That means, you know, I can choose to, to just not see it. I can choose to not see the cameras in my field of vision. So for the social credit system, uh, they had a very sophisticated way to try and minimize or ignore it. Uh, the first um, argument went, um, the social credit system is imaginary or science fiction. So here you see, I think in China at present, we don't have that system. We don't have the social credit system. We don't have this. Um, the second um, uh, reason they gave was it can't be done technically. That, that's a fair argument, you know. I don't know whether WeChat or Weibo will record everyone's data because it is enormous. I don't know if they have the technical knowledge. So this person was saying he was an IT guy. He was saying, yeah, maybe they are trying to do that, but it can be done. And the third one was Actually, yeah, I've heard of that. I know it exists, but it's only financial. So that's, you know, the, the usual conflation of the credit social system with financial credit. So the social credit system would probably be only used for financial matters. I do not really know. Normalizing was another uh, technique used to brush surveillance aside. Uh, many people said it's normal to provide your data because everyone in China does it. Uh, for instance, you see here, it's like the metro. When they started to scan bags, people were irritated. Uh, they said it was useless. If criminals want to do something, they'll find ways. But one year later, everyone is lining up to be scanned. It makes us feel secure. Uh, they also said it also happens in other countries. You know, it's not just China. Most governments use social media as a tool to spy. So it's actually normal. Um, another tactic along these lines was reframing. So reframing the restrictions as temporary. I don't think I'm restricted. And again, you can hear my frustration here. What about books? Yes, I can understand it for a limited time. Or they redefined the scope of freedom. The stereotype about Chinese people is not right. We value freedom. The country makes the laws, the regulations. It's the bottom line for all peoples, meaning we, we have no choice. The other behaviors are my freedom. For instance, what I will have for lunch. Um, other ways of reframing comparisons with history, uh, people saying um, they think it, my parents are not concerned. They think it's freer now. We can travel. We can express opinions. Um, they compare with other people. I'm free, people in the government, some of my friends, they're not free because you have you know, to apply to travel abroad, for instance, or comparisons with the West. Drugs are common in the West. It's not good. It's not freedom. So here you can see the, uh, the way propaganda is, is actually defining freedom and pointing out everything that's wrong in the West. Um, 
So the second main mental tactic was to other surveillance targets to make yourself believe that you are not personally the target. One phrase I heard times and times over it was, I am a small potato. And I had to have this explained by an interpreter. Uh, what do they mean? They mean I'm not a political person, I'm not a very rich person, I'm not a celebrity, so uh, nobody should care about me. I'm not a big potato. There's no need for people to intentionally find me. I'm just a social human. Um, just my personal data are not attractive to them. And that's something that we hear in many Western countries as well. It's not uniquely Chinese. Um, I am a good person. The blacklist is just for criminals. Everybody knows what is good or bad, legal or illegal. As human beings, we know we avoid bad behaviors. Therefore, we don't think our score will be reduced. Um, and above, you see, for the ones who bid the rules in the first place, that's a good thing. The third tactic was to wear uh, blinders. So focus on daily life. It doesn't affect my personal daily life. Um, to say that you would just be concerned if it had consequences for yourself and your family in the short run. I must know what it's used for. If I borrow money to buy a house, will it prevent me from borrowing? And another phrase I heard very, very often, so far, so good. Uh, one of my interpreters explained, it's human nature. When it's coming, we'll think about it, not when it's far from us. I'm not concerned. So far, it does not actually harm me. And the last one was fatalism. Uh, several people explained to me, if you can't do anything about something, it just doesn't matter. You just have to stop thinking about it. Uh, we think it's not useful. It's useless to spend time discussing the social credit system since we can't change it. We are little potatoes. The government is always right. We need to obey. It's like an Orwell's book, Animal Farm. So that was, as I said, 88% of the people, they resorted to at least one mental tactic. Now with about half of the participants, I heard something else, which was awareness of the surveillance behaviors to try and address it, misgivings, objections. So uh, with these participants, I was able to, uh, to, to learn more about the other side of surveillance. So acute awareness of surveillance, uh, for instance, of censorship, uh, sometimes on moments, some articles are deleted. Sometimes I know it's the truth, maybe the truth, Sometimes it's reasonable, sometimes not. Uh, so they don't really know, but they are aware of it. Our generation will have more constraints. When I was young, we had access to YouTube and Facebook. Um, see here, there are cameras on the street. They know if you visited your parents, the books you buy. Uh, people don't know the government and individuals don't advertise the real purpose, so opacity. Uh, it's be, maybe in the first place it was for financial purposes, but then it's behaviors that they want to control. Some very rare behaviors, less than 10 persons in my, in my sample to actually limit surveillance exposure. People uh, putting stickers and QR codes, using nicknames for deliveries, uh, not using the cloud or Baidu. Um, this one was also an IT guy. The, uh, IT guy. If you store an illegal copy of a movie, Baidu will delete it. This means they scan your storage. So you see some people really had very articulate reasoning about uh, surveillance. Um, I heard dislike of surveillance, unease, frustration, dread, fear, anger. Uh, for instance, I hate control. People can't be controlled. And this person was so upset. Uh, if um, I, I, it, I disagree with um, uh, having uh, cameras to recognize children's emotions. It's as if when I'm working, I have an eye over me, behind me, that would feel as a constraint. Uh, not being treated as a human, more like a lab mouse in an experiment. So you can see that clearly these people are not supporting every kind of surveillance. My mother went through the great cultural revolution. They are afraid. Maybe we feel fear if the system is abused or if it, if, it, if it is used incorrectly. But you can see as well the hesitations in these quotes. Uh, there are silences, there are pauses. It wasn't easy for people to express all that. Also, 
some people supported generalized surveillance, but they clearly refused to be singled out by surveillance. So see, for instance, uh, you don't like giving your fingerprints at the airport. That's okay. That's okay. It's equal for every guest. It's okay if it's for every guest, if it, does, it doesn't hurt you if it applies uh, to all people. And here you see, I understand the reason, but I don't want to be monitored. So there's a disconnect. It's almost as um, it's, it's really an, an intra uh, psychic disconnect uh, between the discourse and, and, and what they want as applied to themselves. Then there were marginal but elaborate objections to general, generalized surveillance as well, but that there was like three or four people in my sample. Some people said surveillance is inefficient, doesn't work. It's labeling, it's inhuman. You see, we are humans, we, we won't be happy all the time. Um, it's nonsense to pay according to emotions. It will hurt employees face, face again. It would add stress to the job. It requires that I don't have any bad sides. It's not natural. Uh, other people said, uh, I prefer education. A score cannot change morality, it's inner values. Um, they uh, insisted on the value of freedom. And one person said, actually, that would be breach in equality between citizens. Uh, when I said, perhaps you can have green channels, you can have you know, better access to public services, this person said, reduce tax. You should give us good services. You should not differentiate. Who gave you the power to differentiate us in that way? So here you can see the, the anger as well. So what this book attempts is to de-Westernize privacy and surveillance research uh, by showing that the narratives on digital surveillance in China are systemic. They form a, a cohesive system where you have the anguishing narratives that create the fear and the shame, and then have the solution. The solution is surveillance by the government and technology as a magic bullet. Um, so these narratives are systemic, they are deeply um, uh, embedded in several layers of context, and they are deeply moral as well. So what, what I show is that the normalization of the culture of surveillance, which happens across the globe um, in China, is framed in specifically nationalist and culturally embedded meanings. There are age-old surveillance practices in China um, that helps to normalize uh, what's happening now. There are the pejorative meanings assigned to privacy and an emphasis on horizontal face saving. Uh, so parents, supervisors, social groups that know you uh, for social responsibility. It's embedded in a certain definition of national memory, which uh, as Jen Chong had, had Jen, Jen Wong has shown is distinct from national history. It's a reconstruction of the national history. And in techno-nationalist view of technology as a civilizing force that can re-engineer society, bring it towards greater morality, and help prove the worst of the Chinese civilization to the world, so the Chinese dream. The book also contributes to uh, surveillance and Chinese studies by highlighting the surveillance paradox and the intra-individual tensions in China. So on the one hand, many participants frame digital surveillance as indispensable, but at the same time, they fear exposure and they try to convince themselves they're not personally exposed. It enriches the theories of the surveilled subject. That is, you know, all the studies that explore how people uh, live with uh, surveillance, how they feel surveillance, uh, and the mental tactics, the emotions that they, uh, they express. And it extends the framing of surveillance as care or coercion, which is a, a large debate in the surveillance literature. Here I showed that the cognitions reflect surveillance as caring, so protecting the majority from a supposedly deviant minority, but that the emotions and the subconscious defense mechanisms actually reflect surveillance as cohesion when it is directed um, at oneself. Further contributions are to invite readers to a critical examination of the context that shape surveillance imaginaries in our countries. Because obviously we are also exposed to surveillance 
Um, I don't know which country on the globe is not exposed to any surveillance. So may our surveillance and privacy narratives be moral as well? And if so, uh, what may their moral specific content be? I think that would be super interesting to investigate. Um, and to compare the strengths of the surveillance imaginaries across different national contexts, because narratives are particularly cohesive in China, uh, probably because of the um, education reforms and the, 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 the media propaganda. So it would be interesting to see if in other countries um, it's as, as strong as that. And I hope the book um, is accessible to, to the lay public. It's always difficult when it's an academic book, but it really synthesizes the work of sinologists and it offers many interview excerpts because I wanted to um, give a voice to the participants who had trusted me. I see I have a couple minutes, so if that's okay, I'm going to uh, talk a, a little bit about how I interviewed um, at the margins of politics. Um, so my uh, ethical authorization uh, before I went to China specified that I would, you know, strive to protect the, the, the participants and, and, you know, try to cut the interview short uh, if, the, if they became too political. Um, so one element was the choice of language. Uh, I really tried to mirror the participants' language. For instance, I heard a lot that they were saying sensitive, sensitive. Oh, that's a sensitive topic, meaning political. So I used sensitive. They were not saying the government or the party, the CPC. They were saying the country. Um, so may, sometimes they were saying um, words that were more like parental figures. So I used the country. Uh, I tried to use non-threatening questions. If someone is put on the blacklist, then do you think, et cetera, not if you were put uh, on the blacklist. And also I um, introduced the ideas that prior participants uh, had said or that I had, read, I had read in the media. I was very clear that these were not my ideas or you know stereotypes or biases, but that these were what the other people had said. There are reports that your score could go down if, so what do you think? Then watch the body language for signs of tension. Um, perhaps that's even easier to do when you're not interviewing in your language uh, because you, with an interpreter also, you have more time. And if it's not your language, you have to be more attentive to the body language. So people who are keeping silent longer than usual, that's a sign of discomfort. I saw many people actually doing a weird things with their mouse. They were opening the mouse and closing it, and they hadn't spoken. Um, they were clenching jaws, they, they were swallowing back saliva, they were lowering their voice. Also shaking the head, agitating the hands, um, the classic one, recoiling in one's chair, looking down, etc. cetera. Um, and what I did was cycle back and forth between easy questions, for instance, oh, uh, what do you think of WeChat? What do you post on WeChat? Do you like WeChat? That's super easy. People love discussing that. And then the more political questions. So if I notice tension um, in someone's uh, answer, I would, you know, go to an easy question and let the person recover and then go back to uh, another more sensitive question. In some instances, I had to do what I call an emergency landing. If there was you're saying something that was too daring and then they stopped completely speaking, um, then, you know, I was like, oh, that was interesting. And then what do you think of, you know, emergency landing? Um, different ways in which participants expressed, um, well, different ways in, in which they, I think they expressed self-censorship. Some of them claimed they were not educated enough or they had no knowledge and could not uh, answer my question. Uh, many said they uh, wanted to avoid politics, like, honestly, I'm really not interested in politics, has nothing to do with me, expressing embarrassment, saying too much, stopping dead, I don't know how to comment on this and then silence. And some of them even signaled directly to me that, you know, that that's an interesting question, but do you know I'm a member of the party? Uh, or another person at some point said, I hope you don't think it's propaganda. So clearly uh, they tried to, you know, 
it's it's a sort of dance where you uh, everybody's aware that this is happening, but you are still trying to probe at the margins. So thank you very much uh, for for listening to um, to my presentation, and uh, the book is available if I have raised your interest. Thank you so much, Ariana. And uh, yes, I think you will, if you see a rise in the numbers of books being ordered from Germany or Europe, uh, it's all of us. Um, so, um, yes, we will.